well, good evening. It is good to be with you. It's been kind of a strange week, hasn't it? A lot of cold weather and winter, and uh, I'm ready for the warmth again. It looks like we're going to have it on the weekend. I can't wait. Uh, but I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're doing well this week. It's definitely thrown a curve, probably in most of our plans. And uh, our church staff has been working at home the last few days. I, uh, I always enjoy the office, but I, I actually find that I get a whole lot done when I'm just kind of locked in into my own home office, and uh, it's been a good week. Uh, it's been a little different, but a good week. I've got to talk to missionaries from all over the world. I had a great conversation yesterday with one that is in one of our sensitive countries. You all know the family really well. They were one of our Christmas with the missionaries, and uh, they wanted me to especially uh, just share with you that they are so appreciative of Kaufman Assembly, the prayer, the support, and uh, they're lonely. And I just, boy, my heart went out to them. They're just, uh, they're in a tough place. They're lonely. Uh, it's difficult, difficult on the kids, uh, real persecution. And I just want to encourage you. I, I don't want to share their name on here. Um, just out of uh, concern for where they're at and their own safety, but would you pray for our missionaries? I know your prayers mean so much, and uh, it was good to talk to them yesterday, and uh, I expressed on behalf of everyone at Kaufman Assembly that we love them, that we are privileged to partner with them, that we are praying with them. So I, I just appreciate you doing that. Uh, we've had some great things happening, man. We've got new babies in the church. One of them got to go home from the hospital. We're thrilled with that. We had one born Sunday afternoon. Uh, man, that is exciting. And so what a wonderful thing to happen. A new life. And to those of you new parents, we congratulate you and the families. Uh, man, we're just thrilled. We can't wait to, to meet those little ones in person. And we're believing already that they will serve the Lord all the days of their life. We're going to jump into our, encounter, our Empowered uh, series here with Ch Acts chapter 23 in just a moment. Before we do, let me just uh, remind you, I, I just hope that you'll be with us on Sunday. I haven't gotten to see some of you for a few weeks. I don't know where you've been, but I want you to know I've missed you. We've missed you. Uh, when you're there, it's so much better. Uh, we love you so much. We're going to start a new series on Sunday. We're continuing to build faith in our lives, faith to believe, and we're going to call this series, We Want You to Be Amazed. And uh, we're going to look at the attributes of God. And this Sunday, we're going to talk very simply, we're going to talk about getting to know God. And I want you, I want your I want your sense of divine awe to be restored. I want you to, to have a new, fresh uh, uh, amazement at who God is. And uh, I believe Sunday is going to do just that. You're not going to want to miss it. I have a fresh word. It's going to be good. And the reason it's going to be good is because the Holy Spirit is going to empower it. So I hope you'll be there. In fact, I want you to be there. Don't make any excuses. There's all kinds of things you could be doing. Be in the house of the Lord. You won't regret it. I can't wait to see you. Uh, we love you so much. Hey. Let's pray together and we're going to jump into Acts 23. I'm glad you've uh, tuned in uh, either on Facebook or on YouTube. And uh, let's see what we can get out of this. We're going, to, we're going to jump right into it. Lord, honor our time together. Thank you for our church family, those who are viewing. Use the word tonight. I thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to me as I've read through this. And I pray that some insights, um, some thoughts will bring enlightenment, and a fresh uh, love for your word. In your name, amen. All right, Acts chapter 23, and uh, where we left Paul last time, uh, he is now standing, as we get into Acts 23, Paul is standing before the high council, and he is going to defend himself. And so I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation, uh, some of you sometimes wonder what, what I'm reading out of. Of recent, I have found myself reading out of the New Living Translation. I, it's one of the translations I, I really enjoy. I use the ESV, the NIV. I like to read out of the Message Bible just for my own um, enjoyment sometimes at home. 
But a lot of times uh, on a Sunday, I will use the NIV or the NLT. Here I'm using the NLT. So if you'd like to, you can follow along. We're going to read the first five verses. The word says, gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Instantly, Ananias, the high priest, commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. But Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? Those standing near Paul said to him, do you dare insult God's high priest? I'm sorry, brothers. I didn't realize he was the high priest, Paul replied. For the scriptures say, you must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Boy, that's a tough one not to do, isn't it? You must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Think about who our rulers are. Lord, forgive us. Do not speak any evil of any of your rulers. I didn't have that in my notes, but as I was reading it, that jumped out to me. All right, so let's, let's, let's just think about this. In verse one, it's very clear. Paul is standing before the, the Sanhedrin, the high council, and he's very confident. Uh, he knows he's in the will of God, and he has learned to depend upon the Holy Spirit. His gaze was steady. Uh, he, it was steady. It was focused as he surveyed the members of the high council. And we're told that he had a high, he had a clear conscience before God. And so he's confident. He, he's certain and, and he is depending on the Holy Spirit. I like what Glenn Campbell said about our conscience. He said, there's no pillow as soft as a clear conscience. Isn't that the truth? You can sleep good when you got a clear conscience and, and you can have confidence when your conscience is clear. So Paul has a clear conscience. Now the word tells us that immediately when, when Paul says this, about having a clear conscience, immediately Ananias, the high priest, orders someone to smack Paul in the, in the mouth. I mean, he just hauls off and just smacks him. And uh, I don't know what it looked like. He probably had, at least he was red. Uh, it caught him off guard maybe. He was bleeding. You have to imagine the picture. And Paul immediately, I mean, he's taking a punch to the face. I don't know what you would do. <laughs> I know what I'd feel like doing, but Paul lays into the guy verbally. And it's not, I want you to note, it's not necessarily an anger. We're not, we're not told that Paul was angry. Uh, in the flesh, he might have been, but I don't believe he responds in anger. But he does lay into the guy. And it's out of a sense of justice. You see, Paul, out of anyone, he was, he was knowledgeable. He had served on this high council. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And uh, Paul knew that the law required that a person, a man, would be treated as though they were innocent until they were proven guilty. You know, that's in our, uh, supposedly, that's in our law here in America. But that was in Leviticus 19, verse 15. And Paul knew that was part of the, the law, that he was to be treated as though he were innocent until he was proven guilty. Now, Paul knew that, but what Paul didn't know is that the man that he had laid into verbally was the high priest, which causes me as a reader and, and maybe you as a reader to ask this question. Why didn't Paul know? Why didn't Paul recognize that this was the high priest? Well, let me give you some, maybe some, some reasoning behind that. You see, Ananias was made high priest in AD 47. We know that. And Paul had only been to Jerusalem a few times since that date. And those times that he went, uh, he was only there very quickly and very, very short periods of time. Only a few times, but very short periods of time. So there's a chance that, that because of not being there, that he was unaware. I'm not sure if that was the reason, but that is an, uh, one of the possible reasons. It is also highly likely that due to the Roman commander quickly ordering the Sanhedrin to gather, it's real likely that the high priest was actually seated or standing with all the other members of the high council of that court. Normally he'd be separated and he was probably not in his normal attire. So that's a very real reason that maybe Paul wasn't aware that this man was the high priest. Uh, Paul may not have recognized Ananias as the high priest because the command that the man had given actually contradicted the law. And any high priest would have known what the law said. 
Ananias, in this situation, he, he, he was a person who was responsible for judging the law, but he was breaking the law. You see, our actions either confirm or deny who we say we are. Isn't that the truth? I may say I'm a Christian, but my actions validate it. They prove it. Uh, I may say I'm, I'm this or that, but your actions they validate, they prove who you say you are. Now, Jewish historian Josephus described Ananias this way. Uh, this great historian said Ananias was profane, he was greedy, and he was hot-tempered. And by this account that we just read, Josephus was certainly correct. Now let's continue. Verses six through verse 11 say this. Paul realized that some members of the high council were Sadducees, and some were Pharisees. So he shouted. I picture him just raising his voice and shouting. Here's what he shouts. Brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my ancestors. And I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This divided the council. The Pharisees against the Sadducees. Here's why they were divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits. But the Pharisees, they believe in all of these. Verse 9 says, so there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law, who were Pharisees, jumped up and began to argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. As the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid that they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress in prison. That night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. All right, let's break this down just a little bit together. Paul has a sudden glimpse of insight as he stands defending himself in front of the high council. So where did this insight come from? Well, it came from the Holy Spirit because Jesus promised his disciples and the promise that he promised was for Paul and it's still for you. And here's what he promised. He said, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time for it is not you who will be speaking it will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Jesus said that in Matthew 10. And so that's where this insight comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit as Paul is standing ready to defend himself. And through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, Paul was enabled to be shrewd and strategic. Can I just tell you that it is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that you and I, in all of our situations, when we need to speak up, when we need wisdom, when we need discernment at work, in our homes, in our neighborhood, wherever we may be, we can depend on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to give us the words that we need to say when we need to say them. And that's what happens here. Now, the high council was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. These two groups despised each other. And Paul was able, through the empowerment and the wisdom and the discernment of the Holy Spirit, he was able to exploit this fact. And the council, it was immediately divided. You know, division caused, causes chaos in your home, in your family, in a church, wherever it may be. Division causes chaos, and that's what happened. When division comes, all progress, it, it just stalls. And that's what happens in this situation for the good of Paul. The Pharisees end up taking Paul's side, and, and they declare him innocent. And the immediate result was, was positive for Paul. But ultimately, what ends up happening is, is it adds fuel to the fire. And, and I love what verse 11 says. All this chaos is going on. Paul is, is rescued once again by the commanding officer. They're gonna, the, the, the high council is gonna tear Paul to pieces. There, there's chaos in the room. And they take Paul and they put him back at, at the fortress. They lock him up, he's in prison. And that night, there's Paul. And verse 11 says this, that night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be encouraged, Paul, just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem. Paul, I've seen your faithfulness here. And he says, just as I've seen you be faithful here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. And I love this because let's be honest, Paul is not experiencing the mountaintop experience. 
He's experiencing anything but the mountaintop experience. He is setting that night in a prison cell. He is being treated like a criminal, and he has been falsely accused. In all likelihood, he is probably sitting there thinking that his execution would be next. Now, if you remember, if you've read the Word of God, in Philippi, Paul once sat in a, in a prison cell, and he sang praises. I've read this chapter a few times, chapter 23. There, there weren't any songs this time. Yet in the darkness of that hopeless situation, Paul once again hears the voice of Jesus. Made me think, have you ever received a word from the Lord that breathed fresh life into your circumstances? Man, I have. Those, those words are precious. They keep you going. I'm sure you probably have as well. If you haven't, can I just tell you, you may be in a dark place. You may be in a hopeless situation. If you will have ears to hear and you'll ask him to speak into your life, Jesus will speak hope into your life for exactly what you're going through. You know, God was with Paul and he's with you and he's with me, even in, and I like to say especially in, the darkest of moments. That's what we see here in this passage. Now let's continue, verses 12 through 22. The next 10 verses say this. The next morning, a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. It's a dangerous oath, isn't it? There were more than 40 of them in the conspiracy. They went to the leading priests and elders and they told them, we have bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we have killed the apostle Paul. So you and the high council should ask the commander to bring Paul back to the council. Again, they're plotting his death. Pretend you want to examine this case more carefully and more fully. We will kill him while he's on the way to you. But Paul's nephew, his sister's son, heard of their plan and went to the fortress and told Paul. Paul called for one of the Roman officers and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something important to tell him. So the officer did explaining Paul the prisoner, called me over and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took his hand, led him aside and asked, what is it that you want to tell me? Paul's nephew told the commander, some Jews are going to ask you to bring Paul before the high council tomorrow, pretending that they want to get some more information, but don't do it. There are more than 40 men hiding along the way to, ready to ambush him. They have vowed not to eat or drink anything until they've killed Paul. They are ready now. They're just waiting for your consent. Verse 22, don't let anyone know that you told me this, the commander warned the young man. All right, so 40 plus men take a solemn oath that they aren't going to eat or drink until Paul is killed. Now think about this. Let's set the scene a little more. I love this. The high council, who represents the law, which includes this commandment, thou shalt not kill. The high council, who represents the law, who stands for the law, who defends the law, who proclaims the law, become entrenched in a murder for hire scheme. And by their approval, you may say, well, they, they weren't the, the guys out on the street. No, 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 by their approval, they were involved. And just note this, when you or I approve of sinful action, you and I become involved in the sinful action. Now then, fortunately, Paul has a nephew. Uh, Paul's nephew ends up catching wind of the plot. Now, by the way, this is kind of interesting. This is the only biblical reference to a member of Paul's family. In this passage, we find out he at least had a sister, and we know that sister had a son. That's the only biblical reference to Paul's family. This is another example as well. Uh, what I love about this, I was a youth pastor for a lot of years. Man, I will always love teenagers. And this is another excellent example of God using young people in his plan. Can I just remind you, you may be a teenager watching this. I don't know if you are or not. You may be a mom or dad, or you may be a grandpa or grandma, and you got teenagers. Uh, once in a while, teenagers, when I was a teenager, I could get on people's nerves, I'm sure. Uh, sometimes teenagers, they don't, they don't do things the way us older folks do things. But you know what? They're awesome. 
They're amazing. And God still uses young people. Man, I'm so happy about that. And Paul's nephew, he ends up going, and Paul's nephew goes, and he, he goes to the captain, and he lets him know what's being planned. And as a result, the captain makes some plans of his own. And that's what we discover beginning in verse 23. Now, we're just going to read two verses, and then we're going we're to look at those, and then we're going to finish the chapter. So verses 23 and 24, if you have your Bibles, uh, follow along, and I'll read it. The word says, Then the commander called two of his officers, and he ordered them, Get 200 soldiers ready to leave for Caesarea at 9 o'clock tonight. Also, take 200 spearmen and 70 mounted troops. Provide horses for Paul to ride and get him safely to Governor Felix. All right, so let's stop there. Why such a huge party of soldiers? I mean, that's a lot. That is a lot of, of uh, military power for one guy, uh, seemingly for one guy. Why such a huge party? I mean, we've got, we've got 200 uh, soldiers, 200 spearmen, 70 mounted troops, horses, all this power to get Paul to Governor Felix. Why such a huge party of soldiers? Well, it actually wasn't as much for Paul's sake as it was for the commander's sake. You know, you read this and you think, man, they're really trying to protect Paul. Well, they are, but really what's happening is the commander is trying to protect his, his own backside. Uh, the commander knew that he would be held accountable for a Roman citizen that was in his custody. You see, if Paul was assassinated, the commander would be executed. That explains why all the military presence. You see, the commander was taking no chances here. Most believe that Paul was probably given a military cloak to wear and then he was given a horse to ride so that the Jewish people who saw this huge military force at 9 p.m. at night, you know, it would have caught everyone's attention anyways, but they wouldn't suspect anything because they wouldn't see a Jewish man being, being carried. Paul would have been in a cloak. He would have been dressed like perhaps a, a Roman soldier or a, um, a sort of Roman leader. He would have given a, a Roman horse and he would have been part of the procession. Uh, but it, not, it wasn't just to protect Paul. Primarily it was to protect the Roman commander. He knew Paul had to get to Governor Felix safely or he would pay. So let's finish the chapter. Verses 25 through 35. Verses 25 through 35 say this. Then he wrote this. He wrote this letter to the governor from Claudius Lysias, which I love how Luke uh, re writes scripture, records things, because he gives us names, he gives us dates, he gives us times. And if you go back in history, you can look these people up. Uh, they existed, all right? So from Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by some Jews, and they were about to kill him when I arrived with the troops. If you'll notice, uh, this commander leaves out some of the details, uh, primarily the fact that he was getting ready to beat Paul uh, at the beginning. But uh, let's continue. The commander writes, when I learned that he was a Roman citizen, I removed him to safety. Then I took him to their high council to try to learn the basis of the accusations against him. I soon discovered the charge was something regarding their religious law certainly nothing worth, worthy of imprisonment or death. But when I was informed of a plot to kill him, I immediately sent him to you. I have told his accusers to bring their charges before you. So that night, as ordered, the soldiers took Paul as far as Antipatris. They returned to the fortress the next morning while the mounted troops took Paul on to Caesarea. When they arrived in Caesarea, they presented Paul and the letter to Governor Felix. Governor Felix read the letter and then asked Paul what province he was from. Cilicia, Paul answered. I will hear your case myself when your accusers arrive, the governor told him. Then the governor ordered him kept in the prison at Herod's headquarters. A couple things stick out and we'll finish up this chapter. Did you notice how many times the commander used the word I? Reason being, He's, he is trying to put himself in the best light possible. I mean, uh, I, one, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, eight, at least eight times in a short letter. He says, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Now he is trying to put himself in the best light uh, in front of the governor. But to his credit, he's also good in what he says to, about Paul. And the soldiers do what they were ordered to do. Did you know that's what soldiers do? Soldiers do what they're ordered to do. That, that's what a good soldier does. Now, think about this. You and I are soldiers of the Lord. We're in the Lord's army. You used, I used to sing, I'm too young to march in the infantry. Fly. Okay. Used to sing that probably too. A good soldier does what they're told to do. They follow orders. Uh, so these soldiers, they hand Paul and the letter over to Governor Felix. And chapter 23 ends with Governor Felix doing three things. The first thing he does is he validates Paul's Roman citizenship. Paul, where are you from? What province are you from? So Roman, the Roman citizenship of Paul is validated before a Roman governor. Secondly, he agrees to take Paul's case when Paul's accusers show up. At this point, we don't know how long that's going to be. It could be days. It could be years. They may never show up. Uh, but the governor promises to take the case when Paul's accusers show up. And the third thing that happens is the governor orders Paul kept locked up at Herod's official residence. Now, Paul would have been a prison, um, a prisoner. Um, Herod's residence, we know it had a prison, a dungeon. Uh, it is also the, the residence was where Governor Felix at this time would have been living as well as the governor's um, troops or his soldiers that were there to protect him and serve him. They would have stayed at this, this place as well. And that is where Paul is left. We leave chapter 23 and we leave him um, under, under lock, under guard at Herod's residence. Next week, uh, these chapters are cliffhangers, aren't they? Uh, Next week, we're going to see, we're going to be with Paul. Paul appears before Governor Felix. We're going to find some, some things about what happens. We're going to learn a little more about Governor Felix, which was an interesting character for sure. And uh, the plot is growing. It's building. I hope you will read chapter 24. It's, it is 27 verses, not very long. And I hope you'll do that. And I love the Word of God. Hopefully, you got something out of this evening's time together. And uh, we love you. We miss being together. I hope you'll be with us Sunday. Let me encourage you. Many of you are on the 260 journey with me. And uh, we're having a good time reading through the New Testament. One chapter a day, Monday through Friday. Uh, if you get behind, catch up on the weekends. It's okay. Uh, get, the key is just to get in the Word. Make it a habit and allow the Word of God to come to life in your spirit every day. He'll speak into your heart if you'll allow him to. And so I encourage you to stay faithful with uh, the 260 journey. Hope you're enjoying that. Hopefully you've been, been uh, encouraged and gotten something out of this gathering together. The Lord bless you. Have a great, great night. Stay safe. And we look forward to warmer weather. It's supposed to be in the 60s on Sunday. Can't wait to see you. It's going to be a great day. Be there. I want to see your face. I want to see you. If you're at all able to be there, oh, I want to see you. I've missed some of you. Can't wait to see you this Sunday. It's going to be a great day. God bless. Have a wonderful night.